This program was first broadcast on Canterbury's community access radio station Plains FM 96.9 and was made with the assistance of New Zealand On Air. Canterbury is a melting pot of cultures with refugees and migrants making Christchurch their new home. With new surroundings comes new opportunities and challenges. Stay tuned as Canterbury Canterbury Cultures Cultures takes a closer look at their experiences. This is Lana Hart, the advisor at the Skilled Migrant Business Service at the Canterbury Employers Chamber of Commerce. This service is an Immigration New Zealand program to provide local information and services to new migrants and their employers about work and settling in New Zealand. This week, our guest is Sen Gurigai from the Philippines. Welcome to Plains FM, Sen. Now, Sen works for a recruitment agency in Manila, which helps businesses here in Christchurch find skilled Filipino staff for work on the Canterbury rebuild. The Philippines is Canterbury's top source country for migrants, with around 35% of the region's 10,000 work visas approved last year for people from the Philippines. So Filipinos are arriving to live and work in Christchurch by the thousands. For Christchurch residents, it is now more important than ever to understand the values and lifestyle that Filipinos bring as they become an increasingly larger part of our communities here. To help us out today, Sen has agreed to share some of her thoughts on the differences and similarities of the New Zealand and the Philippines culture. So Sen, in your short time here in Christchurch, what are the observations you have made so far about life in New Zealand? I think life in New Zealand is calm and very organized. You don't see a lot of people on the streets and everybody has this specific time frame as to what time they go to work and everybody seems to stop at 4 p.m. And then everybody has this balanced lifestyle wherein they have time to go to the gym or other recreational things that is usually not available in the Philippines. Interesting. So our work and life balance, you think, is a better sort of quality of life in terms of getting that right. And you're noticing an absence of people. Obviously, Philippines is a very busy country. How many people live there? In the metro, that would be 16 million in In the entire country. Mm -hmm. I think it's around 100 100 million million. now. That's right. So a a large Asian uh, country full of large uh, cities. And then you come to little old Christchurch and you must be quite shocked at the uh, the lack of people walking along our streets. Compared to, to life in the Philippines, what are some of the major differences in what you have experienced so far? Life in the Philippines, we do work longer hours mm. and um, there's a lot of busy people on the streets mm. um, there is a, a lot a lot of gaps between the working people and the non-working people and the the professional people in the Philippines here you don't see that much of a gap All right, so it's more of it's a laid-back thing it's casual and um, in the Philippines as well there is a lot of groups a lot of people go together and here you just don't see the people. They're probably inside the buildings and working until until 4 p.m. Mm. Do you mean that people move in the world in groups, like in families or in work clusters? And is that what you mean? There's more of a collective way of life? Filipinos are social beings. They like to belong. So it's predominant that workers actually go together as a team and um not just families. Mm. They have time for their families, but during the work days, it's usually with colleagues. Mm. They do things together. They they finish a task together. And um, there's, there's a slight difference here because I saw a worker yesterday, a, a Kiwi worker, and he was just working alone in the entire space. He didn't need anybody else to be with him. And then we had a bunch of Filipino workers, and they were in a group. Absolutely. And it's interesting, isn't it? It's the difference between that individualistic society, which we have in New Zealand, and that collective society, which you have in the Philippines, which is a key difference, isn't it? I mean, everything about New Zealand, it's about, you know, being a leader, having a separate bedroom, being someone who can work on their own, being an independent person. You know, our children leave home at 18. In the Philippines, they generally live with their parents forever. for a long time. Not really. So <laughs> um, it's, it's a very forever. different way of life, isn't it? It is, it is. Um, well, we are, we are a familiar society, so the kids stay with the parents until... Until they get married, some yes. some don't even leave at all. Mm. Yes, I do believe that the society here is very independent, and um, it 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 fosters 
positive forwarding mentality. That means you have to stand on your own fast. Mm, mm. You mentioned work hours. What's a typical work okay. day for Filipino workers back home? Typical would be eight hours mm -hmm. with a one-hour lunch break. So it is usual and expected to work overtime, like two hours. In the Middle East, you have longer hours, though. It's like 12 hours in the Middle Eastern mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. or Asian countries. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the gap between rich and poor. There is an obvious gap between it, the people is. that are unemployed or the low-level workers and the professional and political class. Just talk about that for a moment. Okay. The country is very diverse, you could say that. There's a lot of people on the poverty line, below the poverty line. The working class, the working middle class is getting stronger now with the onset of new jobs under the business processing outsourcing. But working abroad, the, the manpower industry is still the strongest industry in the Philippines when we're talking about remittances. Mm -hmm. So it's still a way of how Filipinos get a job at a far better rate because it's controlled. Even in Middle East or Asia, there is a, a specific wage range that these workers have to get. For countries like New Zealand, Canada, Australia, U.S., there is a country-mandated wage rate. Mm -hmm. And that's far a lot higher than anywhere in the globe or definitely higher than the Philippines. Sure. So a lot of workers go offshore in the dream of being able to earn better wages, sending those money, those monies back home, and supporting their family in a better way. How many do that? Do you know how many Filipino workers work overseas in the world? That would be a lot. That would I, be a I, lot. Millions, last, isn't it? Last check, I think it is around 10 or 11 percent of the population goes out to work abroad. Mm -hmm. Though there would be a, a slight difference because most of them become immigrants, so they don't come back. Yes. So the demographics might mm -hmm. vary. Mm -hmm. There's a huge diaspora, isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, why do so many of them leave their families? And ha sort of how can they? Because this is a very hard part for Kiwis to understand, is how you can leave your particularly children at home when you are gone for so long? Is it part of the national identity? Is it cultivated in the culture? Are people groomed to thinking that it's a good thing to do? How does it happen that so many can leave home? Working overseas would probably be the most hard part to do because of the family thing, and I would agree with that. Um, but it's a choice between being able to provide for your family or survival and just being be close to them. And most people would actually be practical about it. They would rather work abroad for a specific contract and go home and be able to provide food, proper education, and everything to their families, and then to stay poor together. Or they could go to, to better countries, and in two, three years, they could actually bring their, their family to that country. So the sacrifice of two to three work, three years, it's just worth it. I think mm -hmm. the mentality is that if I want my family to have more, if I want to, to give my family a better chance of a future, then I have to leave. Emotions would be set aside. The good thing with the internet is that they could talk now. Mm. But even in decades ago, Filipino workers usually just go out of the country because it's the best way to survive. Mm. It's the best way to move forward. Mm. Why do you think Filipinos make such great workers to the rest of the world? Obviously, their reputation is wonderful. They keep going and they mm. keep being wanted. And certainly from the Christchurch perspective, construction companies and dairy farms and aged care facilities in general love hiring Filipinos. Why do you think this is? That's good. Because they're hardworking and they get along with people with other cultures. Okay. So as a, na as a, as a nation, we've been through a lot of colonization. So we are, we can adopt to a lot of changes, a lot of cultures. And um, when we put Filipino workers anywhere in the globe, they have the tendency to actually adopt, get along with people. They don't do clashes a lot. So they don't really, they can handle criticism. And basically, it's, be, it's more of reliability. They, they can learn fast. And they're very hardworking. Mm. Sen, you're here to learn more about the New Zealand way of life so that you can help Filipinos settle in New Zealand from Manila even before they come. 
So after being here a few days, what are some of the key learnings you will mm -hmm. take back with you to share with these New Zealand-bound workers? The primary thing that we need to, to instill in, in our workers is that they need to speak up. The society in, in New Zealand is very um, pl um, level. So if you are expected to deliver something, you have to be able to deliver it on your own. If you don't speak up, if you expect a supervisor to actually tell you what to do in a step, step, step way, then you'd get things hanging and it will not be done. And that would be a bad for business and it's going to reflect badly on the Filipino worker. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing that we need to 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 educate the Filipino workers is that they need to be more independent, they need to speak up their minds, and um, of course they have to better adjust and prepare for the communication language game that is being played Very here. Very good. And Sen, we'll talk more about some of those values in communication in the second part of our interview. We're going to take a short break now and we're going to listen to a special song from the Philippines uh, that you've suggested we listen to today. Sen, can you tell us a bit about this song? Okay. Anak by originally by Freddie Aguilar is is an old classic. It's it's basically about a, fa a father trying to remind the kid about the sacrifices he have done while he was growing up. It's it's a reflection of the the Philippine society wherein the parents would do anything, work abroad, work in far flung places just to provide for the family. Beautiful, and we're going to listen to it now. Thanks, Sen. Nung isilang ka sa mundong ito, laking tuwa ng magulang mo at ang kamay nilang yung At ang nanay at tatay mo'y Di malaman ang gagawin Namustan pati pagtulog mo At sa gabi nagkukuyan ng iyong nanay Sa pagtimpla ng gatas mo Sa umaga na may talong ka ng iyong amang Tuwang tuwa sa iyo Ngayon nga ay malaki ka na Nais mo'y maging malaya Di man sila payag walang magagawa Ikaw nga ay biglang nagbago Naging matigas ang iyong ulo At ang payo nila'y sinuwan mo Di mo man lang itisip na ang kanilang ginagamay Para sa'yo At ang nais mo'y masunod ang layaw mo Di mo sila pinapansin Nagdaan pa ang mga araw At ang landas mo'y naligaw Ikaw ay nalulong sa masamang bisyo At ang una mong nilapitan ang iyong inang lumuluha At ang tanong anak, ba't ka nagkaganyan? At ang iyong mga matay, biglang lumuha ng di mo napapansin Sisisiyag sa isip mo, alaman mo, ika'y nagkamali Pagsisisiyag sa isip mo, alaman mo, ika'y nagkamali Pagsisisiyag sa isip mo, alaman mo Ikay nagkamali What a beautiful song. Thank you, Sen. 
Now, back to our discussion about some of the cultural differences between the Philippines and New Zealand. Every culture has its own values that shape the way we behave and the way we communicate. What are some of the strongest values to Filipinos in general? Belonging. Being part of a group, being accepted, that would be something that Filipinos would strive to get. Normally in the workplace, they would want to be respected by colleagues, by peers, and um, of course there is a hierarchy in, in the types of positions that we deploy abroad, or even in the workplace in the Philippines. In New Zealand, what I notice, especially here in Christchurch, is that there is... Um, there's not a lot of people in groups, so you just see individual people doing their tasks and you don't even know where to place them in, in, in a map of hierarchy in the organizational chart. In the Philippines, the organizational chart is, is, is there. You know where you stand. You it's know so until, mm -hmm. until, until which level of decisions you can make. So there's a leveling in, in, in the workplace. Do you think that this feature of our society, this egalitarianism, is unnerving or confusing to Filipinos when they first arrive? It can be a challenge, but Filipinos being adoptable, they mm. will be able to, to, to adopt to anything. Besides, they're resilient and they're very optimistic about mm -hmm. diversity. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's just more of a mind setting. That way you don't get shocked mm -hmm. and that it is a, as long as there's a clear cut explanation or briefing to them that the employers could probably do as to what they can decide on, what is expected of them. That way they don't feel that they're overstepping bounds. When Filipinos first arrive and in my work, I might say to them, we are used to referring to the boss or the owner or the director by his or her first name. Mm -hmm. And they are uncomfortable with that at first. And is it a insult if we ask Filipinos to do something which they think is disrespectful. So if we're asking them to do something which is outside of their cultural norm, they would refer to the boss in the Philippines as boss or sir or Mr. Mr. McDonald, then are we asking them to do something that is so against the grain of who they are because they want to show respect for that boss? And we should actually be sort of saying, look, you do what you need to do for now to show respect. And over time, you'll know when it's right to call the boss by his first name. I would say it would be best just to have a band aid solution. Before they come over, let's educate them of the cultural differences. That It is not impolite to call the person by its first name. Mm. So, so because if we give those... I think that type would just be a small part of it. Yeah. What would be important is that they stand up in the workplace. So those perception of what is polite and what is rude needs to be established. Yes. That way it's done. Yeah. And you could focus on what is more important, them delivering what is expected of them at the mm. workplace mm. Mm. and them adjusting to the culture since they, they plan to settle here. Mm -hmm. And that is a key difference, isn't it, is getting Filipinos to contribute, to speak up, to complain, to share their opinion, even when they feel nervous to do so uh, and to be a bit more confident. Exactly. Since there is cultural differences, it would be helpful for the employers actually to find time to actually explain to the workers that this is okay and this can be done. So if the workers probably in the first three months have some concerns or they're because of apprehension to, to decide on things, then the boss could actually talk to the worker, mm. find time for it, find time for it. So the good thing about um, Christchurch is that there are organizations that, re that supports the Filipinos, that may, they have a group that they could actually talk to mm. and that would make relocation in, in Christchurch a lot easier to them. They mm. already miss their families mm. and it would be good to belong to, to a certain people, a certain group of people that would have the same values, who would speak the same language. So when they go back to the office, they would be more at ease with themselves, with their own skin, mm -hmm. something like that. Very good. What problems, Sen, do you see arising with the integration of this large number of Filipinos into Christchurch, given that we do have some cultural value differences? As, as any melting pot in any country, in, in any place in the world, 
cultures would change. So we hope that the integration of the Filipino workers in the workplace would actually improve the, the quality and the level of commitment to the, to the work being done. I, because this is a sheer number of volume, so these workers can do a lot more things using the Kiwi standards, but using the determination, the hardworkingness of, of the workers. And the, the Filipino workers are very much willing to adopt, to change for the better. So I think that value would be, would, would help them be part of a, a positive society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it feels to me like it is becoming that, that there's more of an awareness of a multicultural Christchurch, of the role that Filipinos play in it, and especially for the rebuild of our city. Let's talk about the accent. What do you think of it? And is it hard to understand? A bit. Okay. So, um, well, as I noticed a couple of days, the I and the E are different. Yes. Okay. In the Philippines, the English that we know is more Americanized. Though not a lot of Filipinos have the perfect American accents, but we do understand and we're used to the American version. Mm. And then you come over here, the, the E's and the I's are different. So, and there's, as, as, as you've mentioned, there are a lot of fillers that might confuse the workers. So mm. my, my recommendation to the workers probably when I get back would be, just to watch out for the verbs. Yeah. That's what needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, for the action ones. <laughs> yes, listen watch out to what, for the, what, is, what needs to be done. Just yeah. listen for the verb, yeah. and that's it. <laughs> so when you mean when you say fillers, do you mean we add a lot of extra words into a sentence rather than saying it exactly as it as a simplified should be? Sure. Yes, um, it's like you have phrases or, or words that adds a bit to it, mm -hmm. makes the sentence longer mm -hmm. instead of just the the action word that says get this done or sure. you just, can you do this a bit or something yeah yeah would you mind doing this <laughs> perhaps we should do this things like yes, that it's not yeah. very clear really as to do i need to do it or, yes. or i should think about doing it uh -huh. so, <laughs> so i'm gonna sit here and think <laughs> rather than doing it because exactly. that's literally so what they say we just need to tell the workers that if there's a verb there in that sentence just do it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Focus on the action. Very good. Are there other aspects of how Kiwi speak that are confusing? You've mentioned the vowels. You've mentioned the softeners or the fillers that we use. What else is it that's confusing, do you think, to how Filipinos speak? Some actually eat the R's. But I could, I've been talking to a to a limited number of Kiwis, okay? Mm. So I might be generalizing things that I shouldn't generalize. Mm. But I know it is the dropping of the R's as well. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, I think as long as the Filipino workers catch the action word, they should be able to mm. Mm. to deal with that. And language is evolving. It's, mm. it's, it's dynamic. So at, in six months, probably, they would have a, an ear for it. Absolutely. And I wonder what contribution Tagalog or the National Filipino language will make to Kiwi English over time. Probably. As we know, English is all languages evolve. Yes, exactly. Um, we'll the, pick those up. The mm. Filipino language is actually a mixture of a lot of languages. It's English, Spanish, Chinese, mm. uh, Muslim. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of languages incorporated in, in a national language. Mm -hmm. So probably, yeah, right. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it would stay the same because I think it would mix. Watch this space. <laughs> Are there any final observations, Sen, that you would like to make before you head home in a few days? Okay. I think the Filipino workforce will be good to help rebuild the Christchurch. And I think the immigrants that we have here right now are, are going to be instrumental in making the settlement of these um, new Filipinos to, the, whom, whom will be coming over. The, um, the commitment of the employers to assist in the educating of of the Filipino workers and the workplace ethics, the workplace expectations will be would also ensure that the workers don't feel left out. Mm. So it's it's a balance of what the Filipino workers are willing to do in, in terms of adaptive um, of being adaptable, in terms of being resilient and being and stepping up. Mm. And it's also a part of a balance between the employer knowing that it would take time for these Filipino workers to be where they want them to be. Not probably skills-wise, but in, in terms of how they act in the office. Something like that. And, and we're very thankful that the government, um, the immigration, is very, very open to, to providing information 
to both the Filipino workers and um, to the to the employers. That way, the gap between the differences is being mitigated right now. I agree. Thank you very much for your time, Sen, during your visit to Christchurch uh, from the Philippines. You are listening to Canterbury Cultures on Plains FM, which explores migrant experiences of life in Christchurch. Today, we talked to Sen Gurigai, who came from the Philippines to learn about New Zealand in order to better assist Filipinos that her recruitment agency sends to work here in Christchurch. Thank you for tuning into Canterbury Cultures, and be sure to listen again next Tuesday to hear more stories about the migrant experience of Christchurch. You've been listening to Canterbury Cultures, a weekly program on Plains FM, brought to you with funding from the Christchurch City Council and presented by those working in the refugee and migrant sector.